So welcome to the ACE November program. We are very happy to have this program and I think this is going to be a wonderful program. Um, for those of you that don't know, ACE is a nonprofit association of uh, professionals. We provide an array of services based on our expertise to businesses, nonprofits, and other organizations. Uh, anyone interested in ACE should go to www.consultexpertise.com. Um, we do have uh, events coming up, although December is a little bit lighter than usual. We are going to do a ACE social networking Zoom on December 17th at 430. Uh, then going into the new year, in January, we will be holding another of our ACE Connects programs where we will highlight three or four members to more deeply understand their businesses. Uh, we did the first one of these back in October, and it was a good start, and we're going to try to pick a date for that at our next program committee meeting. And for, that should actually say 2021, I don't know why I put down 2020, but anyway, uh, we are seeking speakers for 2021. Uh, in particular, uh, anyone who uh, has ex their expertise that they would like to share but also one of the themes that we've got for the winter in 2021 is how best to make use of technology to, to better um, conduct your business, to be more efficient, uh, to serve your clients better. So that's kind of what we're looking for at this time. If you're interested, please contact me at it's, uh, Terry at practicaldecisions.com. And you can register our events uh, at any time at uh, our website. So if you're curious about how ACE can help you, for those of you who are not members, uh, there are lots of benefits for being an ACE member. We've got our programs such as today, we do webinars, we do networking. Uh, we provide opportunities for you to present your expertise, speaking engagements. Uh, the website has your profile. We have a refer referral resource center. We're trying to work on getting um, members to more often refer each other. Uh, we've got social media groups, uh, we've got an opportunity to showcase books, articles, blogs, and we've got an exciting new program that Kerry has been leading relative to the main biz Ask Ace column and how that links back to longer form blogs uh, in our blog. Uh, so it gives you the opportunity to go more in depth than the Ask Ace column did previously. And we've also got some basic templates and proposals and contracts and those types of things. So. We are also a regional, a, a member of the Portland Regional Chamber of Commerce, and there are a load of benefits that uh, ACE members can get through that as well. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Tom Ranahan to uh, introduce our presentation. Great. Thanks, Terry. So I'm really pleased to, to introduce Kevin Hancock today and a little bit about Kevin and his background. We certainly know the name here in Maine, but Kevin is an award-winning author, speaker, and the CEO of Hancock Lumber, which was established in 1848. They operate 10 retail stores and three sawmills and a trust plant. The company also grows trees on 12,000 acres of timberland in Southern Maine and is led by its 550 employees. Hancock Lumber is a six-time recipient of the Best Places to Work in Maine Award. The company is also a recipient of the Maine Family Business of the Year Award and the Governor's Award for Business Excellence, the MITC Exporter of the Year Award, and the Pro Sales National Dealer of the Year. Kevin is past chairman of the National Lumber and Building Materials Association. He is also the recipient of the Ed Muskie Access to Justice Award, the Habit for Humanitarian uh, Habit, Habitat for Humanitary, uh, Spirit of Humanitary Award, and the Boy Scouts of America, Distinguished Citizens Award, and the Timber Processing Magazine Man of the Year Award. That's a mouthful. Kevin's first book, Not for Sale, Finding Center in the Land of the Crazy Horse, won three National Book Awards. His second book, The Seventh Power, One CEO's Journey into the Business of Shared Leadership Releases, uh, released on February 25th of this year and is being distributed by Simon and Schuster. Kevin is a frequent visitor to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota and an advocate of strengthening the voices of all individuals within a company or a community through listening, empowering, and shared leadership. Kevin is a graduate of Lake Region High School and Bowdoin College. He lives in Maine with his wife, Allison. 
I would like you to ask, Kevin is going to go through his presentation and he will take questions, but if you could hold those to the end, we would greatly appreciate it. So it's my pleasure to introduce Kevin Hancock. Tom, thank you so much. That was lovely. And everybody, hello. I'm really uh, happy and honored and excited to be with you this morning. So thank you for having me. I'm, I'm um, particularly excited to be with this group. You, you know, when you think about it big picture, <laughs> no one does it alone in this world. Humans need help from other humans. And this to me is what makes consulting, which really uh, is helping such a noble and important uh, profession. It may not feel that way all the time to you, uh, but it really is a super important profession. Um, in the world we live in. And really, I, I suspect perhaps what brings you here this morning in part is that there's a lot of responsibility that comes with the perfection of consulting because you're gonna end up giving people advice and sharing ideas and you obviously want that advice and those ideas uh, to be helpful. And really, <laughs> one of the things I'm going to talk a bit about this morning is one of the most powerful ways we become helpful to others is by continuing to develop and strengthen ourselves. And, and I really think that's what your <laughs> association is about. And that's really what this time together is about this uh, morning. And in summary, when I think about what you do, uh, to me, it's really, uh, one might say, helping people see that which they might not otherwise see on their own. Now, with, with that uh, in mind, here's a, a bit of what I'm going to talk about this morning, excited to talk about with you, and have become quite passionate about trying to help others uh, see. So the, the major theme to me today is the idea of broadening uh, the mission and purpose of work in the 21st century. And within that are kind of four key thoughts. First, uh, the highest mission of work should be the advancement of humanity. That's a big, uh, big goal. When you break that goal down and say, well, how does humanity advance? In my view, it advances one human at a time. And this brings me to the third thought, which is, uh, one of the primary objectives of work should be to reach every human in a meaningful way. And to do that, uh, we need to create what I've come to talk about as employee-centric companies, where the first mission of the company is the experience of the people who work there. And finally, I'm gonna to suggest today that we do this in large part by developing a shared leadership model in which all voices are respected and heard. <laughs> the context of the age in which we live always matters and I think it's really important for companies today to pause and think about the context of the age in which we're living because I think there are some pretty dramatic shifts going on in astrological terms to take it on this way we are literally transitioning from the Piscean age 
to the Aquarian age. And that transition um, is real and it's substantial. And in summary, uh, to me, we're coming out of a long, long period of human history that that was, and to some degree still is, empire-centric or institutionally centric, where the focus was on the success of the empire, the organization, the institution, and the individual was taught to sacrifice for the advancement of that empire. The shift that I think is dawning today is we're moving into individually centric world order where each individual is awakening or having the opportunity to awaken to the realization that I am an empire unto myself. I individually am sacred and powerful and valuable and unique and I um, am worthy of focus and prioritization. Another way I think you can look at this um, that parallels what I'm saying is I think we're really entering an age, we're leaving an age of centralized power. And we are entering an age of dispersed power. Quite literally, even, for example, when you think about the way power energy has traditionally been collected and created and how power or energy is going to be collected and created, we're heading towards a time where every building, every piece of property, every company is going to ultimately be a power generating site. And then, of course, with the internet, you look at how information is being uh, dispersed. And as you look around the world today, there is a real shift towards uh, dispersed power. And I believe that part of the, uh, a big part of the social disruption we're witnessing today is that humans are looking for their organizational leadership models to get in line with this transition. The established model was power to the center. This is how you built empires, by pulling more and more power into the center. The new model that I believe is wanting to manifest is the opposite, which is a dispersal of that power back out to the individual in a way that ends up strengthening the organization in the long run. I'd akin it to uh, that iconic line from Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book, the strength of the pack is the wolf. And the new idea is that if every individual within an organization is feeling served and empowered and valued and awake, alert, and alive, that the organization uh, is going to thrive by default, that it thrives on the collective power of the individuals that are a part of that organization. So let's take a look at how it works going today, just to break this down a little bit more, because uh, when it comes to work, not everybody sees what we see. We're all um, collectively really into the potential and the benefits of work and the private sector and so forth. But of course, when you look at the data, that's not everybody's experience. One of the most eye-opening statistics to me, and these are all pre-pandemic data points, but pre-pandemic, every single month in America, <clears throat> 
two and a half to three and a half million people quit their jobs every 30 days two and a half to three and a half million people quit and of course you can think about the economic consequences of that but what about the social consequences the human consequences of uh, that being our reality below is data from the uh, edelman trust barometer in which americans were simply asked if the system the economic system in our country was working for them and only 18 percent polled would agree nearly half disagreed and about a third were unsure in that same poll when people were asked if capitalism as it exists today was doing uh, more harm than good in the world over half of those polled agreed uh, with that statement and so this brings me back to thinking about the highest mission and purpose of work in the 21st century and the reason why i keep coming back uh, to this question is i found that most companies get whatever they prioritize so if a company is not getting something in terms of a result, it's typically not because that company is not capable of getting it. It's simply because that company has not consistently prioritized that um, subject. So I think one of the most important questions in business that maybe is not um, focused on enough is what is it that we're prioritizing? And I'm talking this morning about prioritizing the use of the place of work as a conduit for advancing humanity. Let's uh, just take an even deeper look at the data. I'm gonna uh, reference a Gallup poll uh, from 2019, again, pre-pandemic. Pre so across America, pre-pandemic, approximately 160 million Americans worked, but only a third of them would describe that experience as meaningful or engaging beyond its economic benefit. Globally, the numbers get even worse. Globally, two billion people work and less than two in 10 will describe it as meaningful or engaging. And as a CEO, I find this super unfortunate, socially and economically wasteful and totally unnecessary. And I've given quite a bit of thought and subsequently written about why engagement is so low and i've come to a, a simple summary conclusion that it's because people don't feel authentically heard as they are at work and i do believe that in the 21st century work should be more than just an economic exercise it should be meaningful for the people who do it. But for that to be the case, the way we lead and manage the place of work is gonna have to change. So what kind of change? Well, in my view, the answer, it turns out, um, actually surrounds us. It's woven into the very fabric of nature itself. And I'd like to, tell you how I came to see that or or believe it. Uh, I was doing some work, really actually the first chapter of my uh, latest book, The Seventh Power, I was doing some work uh, on a at a charter school on the Navajo reservation east of Flagstaff. And that night I was out for a, a solo walk in the desert when actually thinking about leadership when the epiphany i've been searching for for a while 
literally plopped into my head. It came in the form of five simple words and it stopped me in my tracks. In nature, power is dispersed. In nature, power is dispersed. I paused, I looked around at a scene not unlike this one, and out loud began asking that scene a set of rhetorical questions. You might have chuckled if you <laughs> watched me. I said to the desert, I said, where's your capital? Where's, where's your headquarters? Where's the corporate governing center? Where are all the managers? Where are the supervisors? Where's the CEO? How's this desert functioning? Which I turned to a pod of cactus and said, which one of you cactus is in charge of all the others? And the answer uh, for me in each case um, was self-evident. The leadership uh, magic of nature is scattered and diffused. It lives in all of nature's parts and pieces, both big and small. And here's the link back. And humans who are a part of nature, not above it or separated from it, ultimately aspire to organize in that same way. When I first started with our company back in 1991, we all had sweatshirts uh, that said, our people make the difference. I've since seen many other companies use that um, phrase, including some big ones like Walmart. And I hope you can see by now that I'm a huge lover of people, but I don't actually believe that statement's true anymore. I think that great people are actually everywhere. So if great people are everywhere, what does make the difference? I think it's culture. I think it's culture that makes the difference. The great business writer, Peter Drucker once uh, wrote that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think that history plays this out. Take a look, uh, for example, at Germany after World War II. So that country was arbitrarily divided along a very arbitrary line. One country became two countries. West Germany uh, went on to become one of the leading economic, cultural, social uh, thinking, creative um, engines on earth, while East Germany hung on by virtue of barbed wire and machine guns and attack dogs until it collapsed under its own weight. But what actually was the difference between the two countries in the decades following World War II. Surely it wasn't on that random day when that line was drawn that all the quote unquote, I don't know how you'd even say it, all the quote unquote best Germans happened to end up on the west side of that line and the less best Germans ended up on the east. Of course not. Germany was then and is today filled with amazing people. It was the leadership culture that makes the difference. We see this today in the two Koreas. I believe the, the South Korean economy is like 40 times larger than the North Korean economy. But it's not because all the quote unquote best Koreans randomly ended up south of that line. It's because of the culture of the two communities. And this is the key point to me. The culture of an organization either disperses power or it centralizes it. It either shares leadership broadly or it shares it narrowly. It either strengthens the voices of others or it becomes a place where the few 
speak for the many. During uh, my work on my second book, I had an opportunity, really interesting opportunity to have breakfast in London with a Colombian board advertising executive by the name of Jose Miguel Sokolov, who was featured a few years back on 60 Minutes for developing an advertising campaign, a campaign of ideas, not guns, that enticed the majority of the Colombian rebels to come out of the forest and come home. And I was interviewing him about that story when he said to me uh, this quote that really has stuck with me ever since. We all adhere to a belief system. Otherwise, we don't have a strategy for dealing with a complex world. Now, my belief system, which I've really just summarized, is rooted uh, in four dates, 1848, 2010, 2012, and 2020. 1848, that's the year our company, Hancock Lumber, began doing business before the first cannonball was fired in the Civil War. And I'm part of the sixth uh, consecutive generation of my family to work for and help lead uh, the company. In 2010, at the peak of the national housing and mortgage market collapse, I began to have trouble speaking, something I never thought of, always done a lot of, and taken for granted. Uh, when I went to talk, all the muscles in my throat would spasm and squeeze and contract. It felt like someone was putting a seatbelt around my throat every time I'd go to talk. And speaking suddenly became super uh, difficult. It turns out I'd acquired a rare neurological uh, voice disorder called spasmodic dysphonia with no known cause and no known cure. And suddenly I had to develop strategies for leading without really being able to talk. When it's hard to talk, um, you quickly come up with strategies. And my primary strategy was to answer a question with a question, thereby putting the responsibility for speaking right back on the other person. Now, when I started this, it was not a leadership exercise. This was just voice survival. So someone would come up to me at work with a question or a problem because I was the CEO or the boss. And previously, I would have given an answer and a directive but I couldn't anymore. So now what I started doing was simply saying, that is a great question. What do you think we should do about it? He or she would tell me, and if it was at all reasonable, which it seemed to me almost every time it was, I then said, that sounds great, let's go do that. And off he or she would go with his or her solution to his or her problem. Now, over, months of doing this and ultimately years, hundreds of times, something uh, struck me, which was really powerful and simple. Uh, and that was this, people actually already knew what to do. It turned out they didn't actually need very often a top down CEO centric directive. What they really needed was the confidence, the encouragement and the safety to trust and follow their own true voice. Let me park that for just a second and go to 2012. In 2012, somewhat serendipitously, I began traveling from Maine out to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in the southwest corner of South Dakota. It's home to the Oglala Sioux Tribe. It's the biggest poorest, most remote, most historic, and probably most traditionally disenfranchised of all the suit reservations on the Northern Plains. It's a place I've now been over 20 times. But in summary, here's the connection. At Pine Ridge, I found an entire community 
that felt as if a piece of its voice had gone missing, had been taken, uh, or was stolen. I'll come back to 2020 here in a minute. But out of uh, those two primary experiences, my own voice condition and my time at Pine Ridge, I had five personal learnings. One, uh, really probably for the first time, I actually did understand what it was like to not feel fully heard, what that felt like, because I couldn't always say what I wanted to say. Second, from my time at Pine Ridge, I really started to realize that there were lots of ways for humans to lose a piece of their voice in this world, to not feel authentically heard, to not feel safe to be themselves. This got me contemplating that inanswerable uh, but alluring question, what's the purpose of a human life on Earth? And I uh, said, well, perhaps it's to self-actualize. Perhaps that's the one thing every human has in common is we're all here doing the best we can just to find our own true voice, to know it, to live it, to love it, and to gift it, if you will, to the shared collective consciousness of humanity. But that brought me back to thinking about the history of leadership. And there I unfortunately concluded that uh, while humanity has been blessed with many amazing leaders, that in total across time, leaders have probably done more to restrict, limit, direct, and control the voices of others than to liberate them. And that's what hit me, that maybe the partial loss of my own voice, which I'd only previously thought of as a liability or a hindrance or quite literally a pain in the neck, was actually something different. Maybe it was an invitation. Maybe it was a gift to lead differently in a way that strengthened the voices of others. And of course, because I was a CEO, I had a platform to not just contemplate this possibility, but to actually uh, work on it. And I since spent most of the last decade um, trying to do just that. I ended up describing uh, what we wanted to try to do as to create an employee-centric company. In that traditional model, the employee is an expendable commodity that exists to serve the company. In the new model, the company would flip that script and would say, no, the company exists to serve these employees in the belief that if we get that right, those employees will take world-class care of the customer, the company, the shareholder, and all the other uh, stakeholders. And then furthermore, after some thought, I concluded that this change we wanted to engineer at Hancock Lumber could be created uh, with four simple sub changes. First, we were gonna need a new mission. Second, because we had a new mission, we were gonna need a new metric so as to measure our progress against that mission. Third, we were gonna need a completely new set of decision-making systems. And fourth, we were gonna need a new commonly understood shared definition of leadership. So let's take a uh, look at each of these. Let me just actually back up here for a second to talk about the first one. Let's talk about mission. The new mission of the company 
was to add value to the lives of the people who worked here in more than just economic ways. Now, you say that, I say that, that sounds pretty simple, but that takes on a lot of deeply ingrained assumptions about what a corporation should do. Here's one simple example that we've all heard many, many times. Uh, the customer comes first. I actually don't believe that's true anymore. And, and I've walked this talk. I remember about five years ago, I stood up in front of a room full of our biggest contractor customers uh, at the Woodlands Club at Falmouth and said to them, you know that old saying, the customer comes first. I don't actually believe that's true anymore. I was so nervous when I said it. I was sweating. There was sweat running down my back. But I went on to explain myself. I said, here's what I do believe. I believe that the people who are going to take care of the customer should come first. And if a company were to do a world-class job, taking care of those employees, those employees in turn will do a world-class job taking care of the customer. So now to borrow a piece of main slang, what I like to say is that the customer comes a wicked close second. We're really into our customers. They're a huge deal to us, but they don't come first the people who are going to take care of them come first. So that's a new mission, and it's a mission everybody can get behind. I think that uh, finding irresistible missions is really important to getting everybody energized around them. This is a mission that everybody in our company would benefit from if we could accomplish it which brought us to the second priority, which is, okay, how are we going to measure that? And again, you think about what a company can measure. 16 ways to Sunday, we can measure our inventory, our productivity, our accuracy, our efficiency, our logistics, um, proficiency, we can measure all of that. We can measure 16 ways to Sunday, anything we can think about, about the customer. But what can we really measure about the most important asset that we're focusing on the employee? Most companies have very little to go by with respect to their most important asset or mission. So as a cornerstone, this is what brought us to participating in the annual Best Places to Work survey. This is a national organization, as you know, that functions in almost every state across the country. And for a very small amount of money every year, you uh, receive a very uh, well-honed, third-party administered confidential survey that every employee completes about their experience at the company as they're experiencing it. And I talk about this all the time. We have been uh, a best place to work in Maine for seven years in a row, but that's not why we take the survey. We take the survey to get the data. We take the survey to get the data. That data produces by location or by work group a very clear voice of the employee experience. From there, pretty much all we had to do was publish it so everybody could see it and prioritize. We asked our managers to make the employee engagement experience their number one management priority. Take this data, look at this data, analyze this data, get feedback on this data, do everything we already know how to do with data that you help people do with data, but now apply it to humans. 
And the great thing about this kind of data is you can check it, that you can sit in focus groups or one-on-one -on -one groups, share the data with employees and ask for uh, context and affirmation or redirection. It's very different than a, a machine that can't talk to you, that you're dealing now with humans who can help guide your feedback uh, with respect to that data. So now we had a new metric and that brought us to our third restructuring, which was uh, a new communication system. And this really simply is how we work the data. We get uh, the surveys done. It provides a rich, rich pot of information on a variety of employee experience related questions. We analyze that data, we look at trends, and then we go into small focus huddle groups uh, show the data and ask for more input and feedback. Now, this step number three is the critical step uh, that requires change. And the big change uh, that we had to engineer was in how we listened. And I've come to talk about it this way, that listening is for understanding, not judgment. Listening is for understanding, not judgment, that all we want to do is create a culture that's safe so that people can say what they actually think. But we all know uh, that in the absence of safety, people will not say always what they actually think. They will hold back. So what, what we simply found is the key to creating that kind of safe culture is to transcend the need to judge or respond to what people are saying. When someone in a focus group says what they think, uh, here's what we want our managers and supervisors to say. Thank you for sharing that. That's all. One of the big changes for me, what, before my voice condition, I always felt the need to judge what I was hearing so as to determine whether or not I needed to redirect or correct it. In this new model, listening is purely for understanding. And all we're trying to do is create a platform where every voice feels heard. Which brings me to this thought, ironically, uh, it's the conformity of thought that kills alignment. I picture um, a communist military parade in a great square, where as far as the eye can see, people are marching in unison, in um, step, reciting in step. But is that really alignment? No, that's power overreaching, that's intimidation, that's not conformity. So let me bring you to 2020 and just quickly show you uh, uh, how this has worked for us and then we can stop and um, I can do what I'm advocating, which is I can listen and you can talk. Um, so here are our survey results on average. So across America, 33% engagement at our company in largely blue collar jobs, it's almost nine and 10 will self-describe themselves as being into their job, into their company and engaged. And how did that show up in our performance well, it showed up in a, in a bunch of ways across the decade, but my favorite, if you look at the green dotted line at the bottom, this is tracking the number of journeys or deliveries that our trucks make out of our stores in a year. You can see in 2012, we made 16,707 trips to bring products to customers. By 2090, our sales had more than doubled, and the number of and our shipping productivity 
improved so much that number of trips we had to make actually went down, not up. We increased our sales by two and a half fold and didn't add a truck and had way more capacity in 2019 than we did in 2012. And then this is my favorite metric and I share it, not um, in service to hit hot lumber, but in service to the ideas we're talking about. I got a hunch and I went back and looked at the data. We ended up making more money in the decade we put the employee ahead of the company. The company ended up making more money than it had made from 1848 to 2010. Our performance took off. Now we all know performance is multi-causational, so I'm not saying this is the only link, but um, but there is a link. So in summary, just to wind this down, this is a, a picture uh, from Pine Ridge. I really think in the 21st century that winning isn't going to be winning unless everybody's winning. And the place of work has got to really reflect that with respect to the employee experience. I also think in the 21st century that quote unquote staying in our lanes is actually really poor advice that of course we need to be experts at our trades, but we also really need corporations to think more broadly about their purpose, their potential, and their benefit. We need more corporate leaders, I think, to get out of their lanes. This happens to be a picture uh, in the basement of the Singing Horse Trading Post on the Pine Ridge Reservation of now two of my uh, dearest friends in life, uh, Varola Spider and Catherine Gray Day. If I had stayed in my lane and only ever thought about lumber, uh, we never would have met. And I'll end um, with this thought. This is really the driving idea that um, that I'm inspired by or consumed with, and it's simply this. It's a hypothetical question. What if everybody on earth felt trusted, respected, valued, and heard? What might change? I think everything would change in a dramatic way. Where might that change occur? I actually think the place of work is perhaps the best potential site for this type of change to occur. Why? Two reasons. First, so many people work. And second, the performance of work will accelerate exponentially in a culture where everybody at work feels trusted, respected, valued, and heard. Which brings me kind of again at closing to what maybe we're all doing here today. I've really thought a lot about how change is created and I've uh, concluded um, that perhaps it follows this model within, beside, and beyond. Within, beside, and beyond. So I had a voice condition and a series of experiences on the Pine Ridge Reservation that led me to change. When I changed and when I could see something different and when I became something different, I was then able to help the company become something different. That's the beside part. Having spent a decade on the beside part, what has brought me now to writing a book or two and being excited to have the opportunity to talk to you and a group like yours is that third circle of trying to help spread that change um, beyond. So I really appreciate the opportunity to um, 
talk with you. And I'm now really interested in listening and hearing what you have for thoughts or questions or uh, things that you'd like to share. So as they uh, say at Pine Ridge, well, Pila Tonka, which means big tags. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, does anybody from the group have a question for Kevin? Sure. <laughs> Go ahead, John. I, uh, Kevin, um, I really enjoyed your your book that I'm almost through now. And um, th thank you also for, this is John Shore, but you're not seeing you on the screen. Thank you for uh, acknowledging the note that I sent you, and I really appreciated your response. Um, I guess, and I, I uh, join up with uh, everything that you've been talking about. Um, my question has to do with, I imagine as you embarked upon this change process in, at Hancock, <laughs> that there were some naysayers, some uh, supervisors who may have thought, you know, this is not what I get paid to do. And I don't know. What, that naysaying takes a lot of different forms. Um, was there some? What form did it take? Uh, how, did, uh, how did you go about uh, uh, addressing that, please? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll uh, maybe answer it two ways. The first was um, I had no choice but to change because I couldn't really talk. <laughs> so I had no way out. Um, so I was all in. And that really, as we know, makes a big difference, right? When a leader's all in, that's different from a toe in the water. So that would be my first answer. But second, yeah, this was certainly a big change at first for our managers and supervisors. What we ended up asking them to do was um, not what they grew up learning they were supposed to do, which was to manage it. So essentially, we've asked all our managers to manage and supervise others a bit less. And to manage and supervise themselves a bit more. I'm a really big believer in that iconic um, thought of Gandhi's become the change you wish to see in the world. And so what we really talk to our managers about is if you want um, authentic, open communication at all levels of your team, all you've really got to do is live that yourself and it will ripple. I saw this with our leadership team when I changed the way I led, when I changed the way I listened, and when I made the executive room much safer and more collaborative and open to a diversity of thought, I literally, over a period of years, watched that ripple out to every other management layer in the company. So really the answer was, I think the leader's gotta be all in, which I, which I was, and you've got to stick with it. But once you do that, um, it really doesn't take a ton of training. I've come to uh, really say it this way, what's difficult is controlling everybody's voice. That's difficult. That takes a ton of systems and structure and constant monitoring. The old model is actually really difficult to create and maintain. The new model, which is more in line with, with the way nature flows, is actually an easier uh, corporate model to create than the old one we're trying to break out of. Great response. Thank you. Kevin, you had me, you had me from the word go. We, um, when you said you constantly decide on your priorities, have you ever read a book called 4DX by Sean Covey? No, I'm writing so it, was, it down right now. It but is no. a completely new 
goal setting system that uh, when I worked with Berlin City as a client, we incorporated into the whole um, their whole structure. And it's it's all about constantly deciding what your top three, no more than three priorities are for that year. So what you focus on increases and it's continually prioritizing those particular areas. Um, he also uh, promoted the power of one book, the power of one same concept, you know, by, by constantly prioritizing and focusing on what it is you want to accomplish. Uh, it makes all the difference in the world. I just took a company from minus 15,000 in the hole to number two in the country using this concept by making sure their priorities were always straight. So you had right from the get go, you had me going. I'm gonna, I, I didn't have a chance to order your book because I was going through hospitalization and everything, but I will order your book. I want to check it out. Oh, thank you. And I love what you just said. And we found that too. And it really was about, and I, and I heard you just speak to this, elevating the goals. Like before 2010, the natural goal at Hancock Lumber might have been the production of lumber and the delivery of building materials. Now, uh, uh, that's not to diminish that both of those are super important activities within our company, but that's that's that we have a way bigger purpose than that. That's the means by which we take on our goals, and we want to be great at our craft. But that's not the that's not the why we exist. And I really do think finding a bigger, clearer why we exist is. Um, is essential. It opens the gateway to this kind of uh, exponential growth in performance. I think you'll like the, anyone else is interested in that book, I think you'll like the book because they use different terminology, like they use the word wig, wildly important goal. What are your top three wigs? And you have to separate process from what it is you're trying to achieve. You know, what, it, what are the three things that immediately impact? And you have, sometimes it takes time to figure that out. You almost have to do a SWOT analysis, you know? You gotta sit down and, and reason that out until you get everybody on board thinking that those three things, and then everybody focuses on that. And it's amazing what can happen. We popped Berlin City 35% the first year that we did this. Yeah, I love that phrase and, and ours. Um... Uh, cover, but it's it's simply this. Our goal is that everybody that works here feels trusted, respected, valued, heard, and safe. That's the goal. If we have 550 people that feel trusted, respected, valued, heard, and safe, we are going to rock and roll. We're going to knock down walls. We're going to set records, and we're going to accomplish anything below that that um, that matters. But getting to a point where 550 people actually really do feel trusted, respected, valued, heard, and safe is uh, that's not easy. And we never arrive there. I'm always really clear. What I'm describing is what we're pursuing. And we, we, you, I have never even neared a point where we could rest in that pursuit. It's really fragile. Well, thank you uh, for your Kevin. insight. Go ahead, Sam. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Kevin, this is a very inspiring uh, for me. Um, when I first got into consulting, which was quite a number of years ago, 43 years ago to be exact, um, one of the, 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 the main thing that I was interested in and in pursuing was improving motivation in the workplace. And one of the programs or, or uh, individuals that got my attention was a guy by the name of Joe Scanlon. And Joe Scanlon was a steel worker in the 1930s, 1937, I believe, who convinced the, uh, the management at a GE plant, or excuse me, a steel workers plant to uh, consider uh, group incentive type work which 
make a long story short, resulted in a program called InfraShare, where any improvements in productivity were shared equally throughout the entire organization between the janitor and the CEO equally. And the result of his efforts and work uh, was that all of the departments in the steelworking shop that he was involved with no longer needed supervisors. And this was in 1937 that this started. And anyway, so when I started in consulting 43 years ago, um, I spent several years doing motivational assessments of organizations to try and uh, find out, you know, or get the management of the, those companies to start to listen to their employees. And the one common thing that came up in every motivational assessment that we did is the employees' complaints about never being heard and never being listened to. And so the companies that hired us to do that were ready to make changes. And some of the, the, the companies that we worked with back then have exceeded the, the norms by tenfold as you have for adopting the employees come first kind of an attitude and a participatory management style. So it's, it's very inspiring to hear your talk and I can hardly wait to read your book. Thank you. Well, thanks for sharing all of that. And it made me think of one other kind of connected thought that we've really taken on in terms of aligned incentives. Um, it's a little bit of a tangent, but we found it critical. Um, when you look at incentive systems for the 21st century, I think the, and, and you were to then say, okay, let's develop the worst possible system we can think of that would screw everything up. I think it's overtime pay. This is a, such a tough nut to crack because it's so institutionalized. But what does overtime reward? It rewards the longer it takes, the more we make. And uh, what made me think of this was that it set a sharing system you described, Sam. In the new world order, what we really need is to figure out how to make the work take less time. And that's what should be rewarded. But with overtime as a backdrop, it's really difficult to do that. And we've tried to take that head on. Again, I mentioned we've now almost tripled our sales across the decade. In 2010, our average work week was 48 hours. Today, it's 40. We don't use overtime. And the second part of this, though, is you've got to come up with new systems that allow people to grow economically. And so we did two things. It was really simple. First, we pretty dramatically increased the base pay first. Our industry was classic historically for people's uh, bottom line paycheck came out OK, but it was because they were working 65 hours a week. So really low base rates. I'm talking about the entire industry in Maine. But you work the every sunlight hour and then some you work. So your paycheck came out. In the new model, to me, it's higher base pay levels that are really competitive to begin with. And then incentive systems, we call them performance gold, that pay for accuracy efficiency and the reduction of how long it takes but breaking that um that historic uh dependency or allure of overtime is a really tough one to take on how do you feel about rewarding groups instead of individuals so i love that i mean i love the idea we, uh, you've got me thinking right now that we don't do enough of that um but i really love that idea i haven't said that a big chunk of our performance gold metrics 
are team driven. We look at a team, we look at the key metrics that would help define success for that team and and their performance goal is the group results in those metrics, not uh, so much the individual results. Your your comment, Sam, about the um, motivational factors reminds me of um, a little informal um, bit of motivational research that Dana and I did several years ago, and this links, links up with, I think, uh, Kevin's themes also. We created a 22, I think it was, factor list that we would ask uh, groups of supervisors and managers to, you know, choose the the items, uh, the top five items on this list, which would motivate you to do your best work in any situation. And the one, I think the top two that always came up were uh, knowing that what I do is important and the ability to make decisions without, to take initiative without close supervision. I think they were always the top two. And that's some of what, what Kevin's talking about. Then we would ask first line supervisors who may have worked with us on this, how they think their people on their teams would respond to the same, the same outline. And invariably they, they would say, oh, they, they'd answer these things much differently. They all just want more pay and this and that, whatever. So we'd say, okay, well, go out and do this with your, your group. And they'd come back amazed because their people answered answered the same way that they did, knowing that what I do has value and importance and the ability to take initiative without close supervision. So I think we're just helping to make your case, Kevin. One of the uh, one of the great questions in the best places to work survey uh, is this: they're all asked comment on this statement my pay is fair for the work i perform my pay is fair for the work i perform and they can strongly agree somewhat agree neutral somewhat disagree or strongly disagree so this would typically be one of the lowest scoring questions nationally and it's often been a bit taboo to take it on it's such a tough personal question but not knowing any better i've totally taken that question on in our focus groups and i said to groups of employees multiple times in focus group now we're not here to talk about any one individual's pay situation but just talk to me broadly if you will about this question when you look at this question my pay is fair how do you evaluate it at a high level how do you think about that you know that's such an important question for employers to understand uh, and and we've gained much more clarity around what matters by again asking and listening in a in a safe way i mean one of the big things try as you might every everybody ends up kind of knowing what everybody else is making <laughs> typically try as you might to keep that personal and one of the big things we hear time and time again is that you've got um, a starting pay level that's X, they look at their proximity to that entry level pay, or if you've got poor performers and they have some sense of what those poor performers are making, uh, there are really consistent themes we've heard um, that, that make sense. You know, again, you, you might, you can get caught up in thinking that, well, everybody just always wants more and but my experience has been employees feedback on how they feel about pay makes perfect sense makes absolute perfect sense from their perspective and again creating a safe culture where you can talk about subjects like that really is enlightening uh, for the company to be able to just listen I call it, sorry to run on on this, but I call um, th this whole thing the answers to the test, that if you create a safe culture and you listen, the employees will tell you exactly 
exactly where to go to improve the company. All you can do is follow them. Cool. Hey, Kevin, I'm curious, uh, as you went along your 10-year journey to the employee-centric organization, did you make any organizational changes from the traditional org chart, if you will, uh, to kind of change with the times? Yeah, we flattened uh, the company a ton. There, there are probably half the layers that were a decade ago. Again, that old model was we got we could get better results through more management, more supervision. <laughs> and the new model is no, everybody leads this company. Everybody's an expert. Everybody's in charge, and that takes. Um, a lot less supervision. It's more about facilitation. We could still do a lot better, but um, that's really the big thing is the layers have collapsed. And the other one that I, I joke about, but it's kind of true, um, like I could sit here, I could probably sit here with you this morning longer than you can sit with me because I don't have anything to do. <laughs> I, I tell people at our company, my job is to, my goal has been to make my role uh, less important or less valuable, less powerful. And, um, and, and I, I mean, my phone doesn't ring. My email box doesn't fill up. I, it, it, when leadership shared, it's lighter for everybody. This model makes it lighter for everybody, even the people on, again, winning isn't winning unless everybody is winning. When every, if everybody beside you on the front line were leading, if everybody's job gets lighter. And I talk about that as putting the work back in its place where, yeah, it's important. We're really into this, but it's not all consuming. We don't have to, um, you know, earlier in my career, I had to sleep all weekend to get ready for Monday morning. And that doesn't make sense either in the 21st century. So, Kevin. Um, Hi, Joyce. Joyce. Hey, so, as you know, I'm interested in changing cultures in healthcare. And love this, I share the consciousness of mattering. And there's new science actually that's been coming out in the last year about mattering um, and balancing a need to feel value and add value. So um, even individually mattering to ourselves, adding value to ourselves. And so we know what you're talking about, this idea of feeling valued and trust, these are primal human needs. And so my question is, as your company gained profit in the last years, um, one of the things that I think in this shift to a new, um, hopefully more conscious and era of interbeing, you know, what, what is there a different idea about what is being done with the profits? And is there transparency around that? And is there more of a consciousness of um, contributing to what matters in a community, um, you know, way? So that's sort of a uh, just a question, because I think that says something, right? That's part of embodied leadership for companies. That's such a great question. Thank you for asking that. And I'll say my first reaction is we could do more and better with that. That's such a great question. But, uh, but I do think transparency around profit and where it goes is super important. We've tried, um, I really believe in localism. Again, this idea that you advance humanity one person at a time. And the biggest way you do that is by focusing on yourself and growing in a way that rubs off on the people right beside you. So my point there is 
reinvesting back in our employees and our company, I actually think you know, it is in the age of localism is the best way we can advance humanity. I mean, what's ended up happening is we've been able to dramatically increase our investments back in our own facilities, back in our own compensation systems, back in our own 401k contributions, and back into the pockets and the work experiences of the 550 we're connected to. Now our corporate giving has gone up and philanthropy philanthropy has gone up, but I really in this localism approach believe that um, that if we can change the lives of the 550, that ripples. That ripples into their houses, their families, their kids, their neighborhoods, their organizations. So, so it sounds funny to say, but we primarily focused on putting it back in, into our own village in, in that localism spirit. <laughs> But I love the question. Thank you. I'd be curious to see what your employees think. Right. Same. They might, they might, they undoubtedly would not say exactly what I'm saying, which is the whole point of the talk today. And I think it, it's really, it would be really healthy for us to ask them about that topic and listen to what they do say. Totally. Yeah, I've um, I've taken a ton from um, from you all here this morning and just kind of listening to the different things that have come up. Um, John, did I see you raise your hand? Yes. Um, I just wanted to thank you uh, so much, Kevin. We've met and it's been a while, but uh, pretty much everything you've talked about is uh, over 19 years of uh, coaching and a 22 year corporate career. It's basically what I've done. I um, found that my sweet spot is where self-leadership and business leadership come together. And so as an example, um, one of my clients, when you get off the elevator to their headquarters, their mission statement is right there. And it says to improve the lives of employees, customers, partners, and our community. Uh, and obviously it has nothing to do with what they do for, you know, right? Um, and then to your point about, um, I love the uh, within, beside, beyond, um, I'm actually taking a sizable companies management team through an eight month uh, leadership training right now. And it very much parallels that same idea. Start with yourself, how you affect others, how you are on a team, and then how you are for the business and beyond. And, but it starts with the self. And, and so I, and I'll leave you with this, that you'll love this. <laughs> Real near the beginning when I was doing my coaching, I'm at the coal farm at a breakfast coaching session. <laughs> and, and the le leader says to me, which I now live a half a mile from on the 10th uh, fairway of uh, Spring Meadows. <laughs> um, but anyways, this member says to me, I know why you get in this profession, Doug. This is like 17 years ago. And I said, why is that? He said, you want to evolve you. <laughs> and I said, guilty as charged. I, I learn more. <laughs> Than any of my clients because I'm wanting to involve them. So I told my wife, I said, I think I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing because I feel like I'm helping and learning from friends. So it's, that's lovely. I feel so uh, blessed. Love it. I well, love you, uh, you have, I'm guessing that you have a uh, head of leadership training or um, development. We, we do. But I would say, yeah, I would say the um, the training to create a employee centric company that listens. We didn't do a ton of it. We more focused on what you just said, which is I need to become it, and then get our executives to become it, and they get their managers to become it. Yeah. Yeah. An example, like you say, which you know, yes, 
awful easy to say I want feedback and then they're held up, but then when one does quite often we the reaction is not positive. <laughs> yeah. So true. Yeah. It's about modeling behavior. Yeah. Hey Kevin, uh, uh you know I want to be respectful of everybody's time and this was yep. but I really do want to thank you uh for uh being here today and as as I figured would happen, it was very engaging for everybody involved. I would like to uh, turn it over to John Shore to make a presentation to you and then have Terry close us off. Thanks, Tom. Kevin, thank you so much for, as others have said, a very inspiring uh, conversation. I don't know if you can see this, certainly can't see it clearly, but we have a highly, <laughs> highly sought after memento that I will be sure you get. And there are two, two little plaques on it. The top plaque has the, the ACE uh, logo. And below that is a little plaque with your name. And under that, it, in quotations, it says, I aced this program. So we'll look forward <laughs> to getting that to you. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah, there's a new one. Thank you, Kevin. A great piece. <laughs> yeah, th thank you, Kevin. This, this has been great. I, I, in reflecting on what you were, uh, as you were doing your presentation, Ironically, I think you've given voice to one of the reasons that I became a consultant and got out of corporate America. So uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Um, everybody, our next program is our ACE Zooming Social uh, on December 17th at 4.30. And we will be, you know, registration for that is open. To, and the only reason to register is to make sure you get a link because that's how Judy knows who to send the links to. So I uh, look forward to seeing you then. And uh, again, thank you, Kevin, so much. This has just been great. It was my pleasure. Thank you. I love the energy and the kind of honest, authentic will to do good in the world that I can tell you you bring together. So it was um, uplifting for me to be with you. Thank you. Thank you.